Thank you, ma'am. I'll watch for the signal. Okay. Good morning. Today is Friday, June 5th. It's 10 o'clock, and this is a meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Um, we have, where this is day three of a series of discussions around um, our Act 250 work for the session. Um, and today we're, we've talked already some about uh, development provisions that are currently in S-237, force block provisions uh, yesterday, Thursday, and today we're focusing on uh, uh, force products industry and provisions related to support management of uh, force products industry, as well as revisiting trails. Um, so with that, as we've done each day, I've been working with council to prepare, um, well, she's been preparing, we've been discussing uh, <laughs> to get documents prepared to help us uh, look at the relevant law and as well as to see how things are traded in current law versus the different proposals that are moving out there, namely H926 uh, and S165. So with that, um, I'd like to pause and uh, turn it over. If Are there any committee questions before we launch into this? Okay, seeing none. Um, good morning, Ms. Schakowsky. What have you got for us today? <laughs> good morning. Where would you like me to start? Well, uh, so the, the agenda says forest products and <laughs> recreational trails. So I have provided documents um, on both of those subjects, I have a PowerPoint on the forest products language in H926. And then for the trails language, I isolated the recreational trail language in 926, and that's posted. And then I also provided a summary document um, that is based on the conversation we had um, at the last hearing about trails on determining jurisdiction over trails under Act 250. Okay, great. So um, the trails piece could take th the entire 90 minutes we have and then some. So let's um, spend, maybe it's only 10 minutes, but let's, let's do the forest products uh, industry provisions. Well, so I can see you laughing. That might be more than 10 minutes, but um, it's more discreet and maybe more settled amongst parties. So if we could go through that, and this committee's worked on it repeatedly over the years. Um, what do we allow? How do we regulate? Sure. Okay, so H926 contains a couple of provisions related to forest products industry. So first, it adds new definitions in section 6001. There is also new language in the permit condition section and then there is a section related to the mitigation of primary agricultural soils. So to start, uh, we have this language that adds the definitions of forest-based enterprise as well as forest product. So forest-based enterprise means an enterprise that aggregates forest products from forestry operations and adds value through processing or marketing in the forest product supply chain or directly to consumers through retail sales. Forest-based enterprise includes sawmills, veneer mills, pulp mills, pellet mills, producers of firewood, wood chips, mulch and fuel wood, and log and pulp concentration yards. Forest-based enterprise does not include facilities that purchase, market, or resell and resell finished goods such as wood furniture, wood pellets, and milled lumber, without first receiving forest products from forestry operations. So uh, we're, we're in a, a universe of, of industries that are the forest product industry, because you may remember that forestry and logging is exempt under Act 250 below 2,500 feet. Okay. Um, um, is there gonna be anything coming that relates to how long such a facility will exist and operate? No. Okay. So I'll just flag this for myself and maybe for others. I mean, some of the conversations over the years have been that uh, a log yard or a sawmill might be set up on the, 
uh, uh, or chipping yard might all be relatively uh, temporary facilities there for a year or two until operations have finished in an area and then you'd be moving on. Um, I don't, uh, the only pellet mills I know of, I think are permanent. So let's, I'll just flag that and we can keep going, thanks. So uh, then there's a definition of forest product, which means logs, pulpwood, veneer wood, bolt wood, wood chips, stud wood, poles, pilings, biomass, wood, uh, fuel wood, maple sap, and bark. So um, those definitions are then used in the new language under 6086C. So 6086C, um, the new language is on slide two, but the current law is on slide three, and I'll touch on it briefly. Section 6086C contains the language regarding permit conditions, and it says a permit may contain conditions which are appropriate. Uh, that's sort of the big takeaway. Uh, conditions also have to be reasonable. So uh, we're going to amend this section with new language related to forest products industry. So the new language are permit conditions related on a forest-based enterprise. So a permit condition that sets hours of operation for a forest-based enterprise shall only be imposed to mitigate an impact under criterion one, which is air pollution, five, which is traffic, or eight, which is aesthetics. So that also includes noise. B, unless an impact under uh, air pollution or traffic of this section would result, a permit issued for a forest-based enterprise shall allow the enterprise to ship and receive forest products outside regular hours of operation. These permits shall allow for deliveries of forest products from forestry operations to the enterprise outside of permitted, opera permitted hours of operation, including nights, weekends, and holidays for a minimum of 60 days per year. In making a determination under this subdivision as to whether an impact exists, the district commission shall consider the enterprise's role in sustaining forest land use and the impact of the permit condition on the forest-based enterprise. Conditions shall only impose the minimum restrictions necessary to address the undue adverse impact. Uh, three, permit conditions on the delivery of wood heat fuels a permit issued on, uh, to a forest-based enterprise that produces wood chips, pellets, cordwood, or other fuel wood used for heat shall allow shipment of that fuel wood from the enterprise to the end user outside permitted hours of operation, including nights, weekends, and holidays from October 1 through April 30 of each year. And four, forest-based enterprises holding a permit may request an amendment to an existing permit conditions related to hours of operation and seasonal restrictions to be consistent with these subdivisions, requests for condition amendments under this subsection shall not be subject to Act 250 Rule 34E. And we, I, have a, I have a couple of slides on Rule 34E, but that's the Stowe Club Highlands analysis. Um, and so we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, are there questions on this? Is this more or less restrictive than the ability of ambulances to operate? I do not know. I'm not surprised. Thank you. So I already touched on, uh, were there other questions on the new language? Okay. So I touched on what section 86 C says, um, there is another existing provision related to forestry forest products um, industries under 6084 G, which allows um, smaller uh, forest processing uh, operations to be uh, a minor application under Act 250. And those, oops, you just went by some criteria. 3,500 cords allows you to be a minor operation. That's a lot of wood. <laughs> um, a serious question, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, sir. 
the uh, Rye Gate was um, 30 truckloads of chips a day. Montpelier District Heat was one load of chips a day. What does the number of cords that we just heard um, equal in truckloads? I don't know. I don't because to me it's it's interesting, but but it's um, uninformative at this point. It doesn't it's meaningless. So. Okay. Well, maybe we can get some uh, help from Commissioner Snyder on that one. You know. I mean, yeah. Okay. Good. When I see people get a truckload of logs delivered to do their own um, cutting and splitting, they're getting usually uh, roughly eight to ten cords out of that truckload. So anyway, it. 35 is a substantial number, 3,500. Um, so let's keep cruising along, thank you. I mean, I, I, for me, I'm just kind of recognizing that this is a this is a pretty big give. I'm just gonna, this is the administration's proposal, correct? Yes. Yeah. It is in 926 as passed the house. Mm -hmm. From the, from the committee or floor amendment? I'm sorry? Was it this from the committee? This was in the committee's bill. It was yeah. not a floor amendment. Thank you. I mean, I don't know any other industry that has that gets this kind of thing, but I'll I'll just leave it there and mute milk. myself <laughs> for now. For now, <laughs> milk milk does, but yeah. fair. So uh, we haven't talked specifically in this committee yet about what Act Two Fifty conditions are or how they are added to a permit. Um, I think you all are fairly familiar with, but I did sort of go through the steps on this slide. So when someone applies for an active 50 permit, it's either granted, denied, or granted with conditions. Um, conditions are added when a district commission um, believes a proposed project causes undue adverse impact under a criterion. And so they add these, these conditions to ensure the project complies with the criterion or they'll have to deny the application. The district commission decides on a case by case basis whether to impose mitigating conditions and which conditions to impose. Uh, if a district commission cannot draft permit conditions to alleviate the undue adverse impact under a criteria, they will deny a permit. So conditions are added so that a permit can move forward. They have broad authority to tailor permit conditions and to be a little bit creative in order to reduce the project's impacts as long as they are appropriate and reasonable, and they have to have an appropriate relationship to the criterion they are addressing. So a district commission does not have authority to require permit conditions without a finding that it is necessary for compliance with any of the 10 criteria. So they are, conditions are added for a specific reason. Uh, permit conditions are compulsory and they must be abided by unless the commission changes them. Um, the Natural Resources Board has enforcement authority over permits and permit conditions and can bring enforcement action against those who are not following their permit conditions. If someone would like to change their permit conditions, they use uh, Rule 34 of the Act 250 rules. So Rule 34A says that if the change is going to be a material change, um, they're gonna need to go through the Rule 34E process. Um, if it's a minor change and it won't be material, it can go through the administrative amendment process, which doesn't require a hearing, um, has minimal notice, and it's a much quicker process. Um, so not all changes to permit conditions are material, but those that are material have to go through the Rule 33, Rule 34E analysis, which is uh, the codification of the Stowe Club Highlands test. And that test came from the Supreme Court, but it was based on the Environmental Board's rules um, that balance flexibility versus finality. So the courts and the board were concerned that um, allowing people to amend their permit conditions would sort of prolong the application process. There was concern that if you allowed anyone to change their permit conditions at any time for any reason, um, it would have impacts and the, the finality of a, of a permit is important. Um, so, but there are, there are often um, circumstances where, where things change 
and there needs to be some flexibility. So this test balances those two competing issues. And here is the, the steps that you take in the analysis. So this is the, the um, analysis that this new language um, in H926 seeks to um, go around. So this language in 926 um, exempts changes to permit conditions for these forest products industries. Um, they don't have to go through this process if they wanna um, change their hours of operation and seasonal restrictions. So uh, typically the analysis starts with the first question, whether the applicant proposes to amend a permit condition that was included to resolve a, cr a critical issue in the permit. So not all permit conditions are critical um, but uh, if it is, the district commission must consider whether the applicant is merely seeking to relitigate the permit condition or undermine its purpose or intent. Then the district commission weighs the competing goals of finality and flexibility, and it does so by looking at this list of factors. So briefly, it looks at have there been changes in law or regulation or in the facts of the situation that are beyond the permittee's control? Have there been changes in technology, construction, operations, um, other factors including innovative design or alteration of design, um, important policy considerations that further the goals of the municipality, manifest error uh, on the part of the district commission, board or court, and uh, the degree of reliance that um, parties have on the permit conditions. So in weighting, in weighing these factors, if it weighs in flexibility, the condition can be changed by the district commission. So, so, in, Madam, so Mr. Chair, just in a, I'm trying to understand those. And for example, um, yeah. the state of Vermont were to say trucks can be another 10 feet longer as they do every 15 or 20 years. Um, and now the, the trucks that deliver are 15 feet longer and they don't meet the permit condition. Is that what we're talking about here? I think that could be um, considered under the first factor because that would be something beyond the permittee's control. Or trucks operated for years and now they invented something new called Jake brakes and they want to use Jake brakes on their truck. Would that be one of those things? Um, uh, what kind of permit condition would that relate to the use of brakes? Oh, sound. sound. Oh, yeah. maybe. I'm not entirely sure about that. Okay, thank you. Are there any Are there any other questions about the permit condition uh, stuff? And uh, um, how long has Rule 34E been operating? Is this well established? Yes. Yeah. Um, the, let's see. Uh, Stoke Club's Highland, the case was in 1996. Okay. And uh, the analysis in that case had been used previously by the environmental board. So I am not certain, but it is a fairly long time. Okay, great. Thank you. 1996. Yeah. Yes. So, so, Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator McDonald. I don't want, I'm not trying to take up a lot of time, but no. But I, I remember as a kid going logging and a truck would pull into the place where you unloaded the logs in daylight and they'd roll the logs off and, you know, you get your check and, and you would leave. And now we have, um, wood products are delivered um, in tractor trailer trucks and in some places I don't know if they exist in Vermont or not the trucks pull into uh, kind of ramps they drive it the truck into the ramp and the ramp tips up in the air where the whole cab of the truck goes you know 10 20 however many feet up in the air and all the products slides out the back and they do this 24 hours a day and how does how would a trans, such a transition be dealt with under the law? Or 
when things get bigger and noisier and louder, um, how do, does, does the law say, well, things are bigger, noisier and loud, louder. You, if you didn't want this to happen, you shouldn't have allowed the place to be here to begin with. Or does the law say you can't do it because it's bigger and noisier and louder? How does that decision get made? So it depends, I guess, on if the facility already has its permit or if they're trying to amend permit conditions. So when you're applying for the permit, um, either an interested party or the applicant itself has to, you know, uh, explore whether there is an undue adverse impact um, under the criteria. And so criterion eight under aesthetics does address noise. And so if the district commission was concerned about the level of noise and found that it needed to be mitigated because it was an undue adverse impact, um, they would potentially draft conditions that would either um, there, there are multiple ways to address noise. So either limiting the hours, um, requiring some kind of screening, um, some kind of offset of where this, the noise can occur. Um, and if the operation was becoming more and more noisy, that is when you sort of look at if there has been a material change or just a slight change. And, and these are pretty fact dependent things. If it's a permitted establishment with a condition that says they cannot exceed a certain amount of noise, um, they potentially will need to go through this Rule 34E process. The, to the say conditions- to, to go through the process to say the noise limit notwithstanding, they can continue to do it anyway? Potentially. Um, so the new language in H-926 is related to operating outside of previously established hours of operation in the permit. So allowing them um, to operate outside what has already been established as their permitted hours of operation for um, sort of seasonal periods of time. And is that for all operations or just shipment in and out from the site? I, let's see. I mean, I see in three, for instance, a shipment related provision. Um, yep, and so that's, that's related to just a, a specific window of time from October to April. And then, and then under two, there's an, they're allowed to operate for a minimum of 60 days per year outside of um, the regular hours of operation um, for deliveries. I mean, I, I think we're all familiar with the whole issue of, um, especially if you're on areas with dirt, you want to be in and out while things are well frozen. And that may well be at three in the morning, not Yep. 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 But, good um, policy. running <laughs> there, um, I'll just say having been near um, whole, whole tree chippers, for instance, that's a sound you can hear a mile away, no, yep. no problem. So that would be very different than a truck going in and out. Um, so, okay. And so that kind of thing, so the, the operations, uh, I'll pick some the noisiest thing I can think of, which is whole, whole tree chipping. Um, are th that, is that permitted to operate outside of uh, permitted hours of operation by any language here? I don't see, I don't read it that way. I just don't want to misread it. Um, under, th no, under three, it's talking about um, shipment of the fuel. So, uh, I think that would primarily relate to uh, trucks driving out with the material. Yeah, okay, thank you. So it, um, it, it, after the chair's question, um, you know, there people chip in the daytime and they often fill trucks in the daytime, but they won't run those trucks out because 
They're waiting till two o'clock in the morning when the roads are frozen again, which is sound and wise practice. But then they leave at two in the morning. Does that mean that they deliver an hour and a half later when they get to, to their place of delivery? And now they're you know driving in and driving out and making a racket when they unload so that they can come back the next morning and get the next load of chips that they're gonna wait until two o'clock in the morning to, to move. Um, is, is this complicated stuff, Mr. Chair? Right, and that's on the receiving the receiving end. I don't know, for instance, if any, uh, well, just right next to me, the, the local high school gets chips, large chip deliveries. So, um, but it's discreet enough that far enough away from everyone, I don't think it interferes, but I don't know what the other sites are. Um, Senator Camping, you had something too? I, again, I, I go back to what other industry do we allow to make these kinds of permit changes, um, sort of make it so easy for them to do? Uh, and uh, again, I'm just raising a question. I continue to have concerns. Um, and uh, I guess it, it does raise something that I'll just put out there again, or, or put out there that I was thinking about last evening after yesterday's discussion. I don't think we have heard yet from, and I know it, this is a little bit just going back to, to yesterday's conversation, uh, but I think we need to hear from a forester on some things. Uh, uh, and I, we have not heard from a forester. Um, and I know there are a lot of foresters out there uh, that we might want to um, have give us some real consulting, some real thoughts, particularly around, I mean, we have, People in the administration who have a certain philosophy around some of these things, but I think for a more balanced conversation, hearing from a forester, um, you know, around the what we were talking about yesterday with roads, and then some of these other policies, I, I think could be helpful. And, and I'll just leave it there. Um, if anyone on this call wants to recommend someone, I did reach out to um, uh, Bill Keaton at UVM, who when I was on the biomass energy development working group. So same issue, uh, but eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, he, he was very helpful then. And so I reached out to him, but I'd be happy to get recommendations from anyone on the call about other- Sure, and I, I, can take a, I can take a look in and ask around also. Sure. To hear, uh, so we hear maybe a little bit more of a balanced, uh, a balanced uh, testimony. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Ms. Schakowsky, do we have more slides in this deck do, or do we get to the last one there? Just one last one. Okay. So the last provision related to the forest products industry in H926 adds new language to the mitigation of primary agricultural soils. Um, that's in 6093. So uh, it adds new language that says, notwithstanding any provision of this chapter, a conversion of primary agricultural soils by a forest-based enterprise permitted under this chapter shall be entitled to a ratio of one-to-one -one protected acres to acres of affected primary agricultural soil. So when you're doing mitigation for prime ag soil, Currently under the law, the rate of mitigation, as you see at the bottom of the slide here, depends on where the project is located. So in designated areas and in industrial parks, um, you can pay a fee for mitigation based on a one-to-one -one ratio. In areas outside of the designated areas, there's on-site mitigation and it is a calculation of the ratio between two to one and three to one. Um, so this potentially would be lowering the threshold, the ratio to one-to-one. -to -one. So this this would consume more prime agricultural soils. Yes. Okay. And yeah, the only other thing I wanted to add was um, because I'm rushing and I, I know I'm not maybe being the most clear. You may remember the Commission on Act 250, the next 50 years. The final report has um, they considered a very specific proposal to this deck of slides, and so there is a, a two-page overview of what the Commission found when reviewing this and what um, their recommendations were. So if you at another time want to look at it, there's information there. 
Okay. Does, does that rec does that recommendation say um, recommend that there be more use of prime agricultural soils for something other than agriculture, or less use of primary agricultural soils for uh, they things did, other than agriculture? They Just did the, not recommend adopting this language. Thank you. Okay. So thank you for giving us a, um, sort of somewhere between 30,000 and 10,000, the 14,000 foot view, <laughs> and that's helpful. And um, now let's um, turn, uh, any questions for Mr. Joukowsky before we move on to some of our other witnesses for this morning? Okay. No, Great. but thank you, very helpful, thank you. Yeah, I mean, clearly this, <laughs> I'll be printing off this deck and reading it through more than once. Uh, there's a, you've distilled a lot out and I appreciate that, but it's, I'm gonna need to study it um, before we convene again as a committee on this topic. Uh, we haven't heard anyone from anyone yet about why these proposals were, the administration brought these proposals to the house. Uh, and that's my understanding of where they originate. So uh, Commissioner Walk is on the, uh, Paul, as is Commissioner Snyder. I don't know you all and the uh, A&R world are, and Mr. Lincoln's here and maybe somebody else too. Uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Chair, use your time as you wish amongst Ms. yourselves. Mr. Sure. Chair, yeah. before we listen to these witnesses who are going to testify on what we've heard so far, yes. one of the things, one of the things we know today is um, Foresters, like all others, and um, in this industry, in this industry and other industries, are worried about costs and expenses and, and making a living. Um, one of the there a couple factors are going on today, such as much of the infrastructure and trucks and vehicles that harvest forestry are not in use; they're parked, and um, they're parked because the the markets are not there to burn chips. So there are a surplus of those vehicles. And we, we, we know that the 20% of our ash trees are gonna be dying in the next um, decade or so, which is gonna drive down the cost of the price paid for chips by landowners who wish to get something out of this wood before it becomes worthless. So we, we know that there are people eager to work and put stuff to work. And we know that the cost of chips compared is gonna drop compared to what it would have been if there wasn't this, um, this disease attacking chips. So I would hope that any recommendations and testimony we have takes those two factors into account. And um, because that's the, future of the forest economy and that we don't just say we're trying to save them money um, when there are going to be you know opportunities for uh, getting cheaper product thank you so um, I just I, thanks for bringing that up we've talked about it a little uh, but in this context um, I'm trying to think of what kind of things are you considering? Uh, us doing Senator McDonald because right so we have emerald ash borer a lot of uh, ash is going to be taken down before it's diseased and worthless as you point out so uh, are you thinking that um, who, that people for instance landowners might say this isn't a great price but I'd as you're pointing out I'd rather get something rather than nothing so then there's a lot of wood offered cheaply that moves into the marketplace and then how might we respond to that? I'm not following that last step. Which, which means that um, when the people who harvest and burn wood, um, chips, will know that the, the folks doing the work and delivering the product are getting it at a lower price. We often are told we need to make these changes in our environment or use up prime ag land because there's such a razor competitive edge that um, we have no choice or we need to be, we need to 
to take into account the um, the expenses in the of the logging of the forest industry. The forest industry is going to be able to buy product more cheaply than it would have. And how does that figure into our deliberations for the next decade? So, okay, great. So I'm keeping an eye on the clock, and I'd like to spend only about another. 10 to 15 minutes tops on this. So it's not that we're gonna solve everything, but I just would like us all to have sort of a solid introduction to current language proposals and, and hear from the parties that are looking at it pro or con. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to turn to the a &R team and I invite you folks to weigh in on this. All right. Uh, for the record, Peter Walk, Commissioner of the DC. Um, I'm going to defer entirely to the uh, Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation and State Forester, uh, Michael Snyder, as well as Deputy Commissioner Lincoln, as they are the experts here and are bringing, have brought forward this proposal as a way to help address the economic conditions around forest operations and forest landowners so we'd be able to keep our lands in forests. Senator Campion asked a question about which industries receive similar outcomes. If we look at our working lands as a composite of our forest and our farms, you see a completely different outcome for forests than you do for farms. And we are attempting to make some of that what is available to farms, available to the forestry operations in order to be able to keep our forests in forest, in forest operations so that they can continue to be uh, kept from being in a fragmented condition. With that, I will hand it off to Commissioner Snyder. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Walk. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Again, appreciate the chance to speak with you on this. Um, Hearing your deliberations uh, as Ledge Council walked you through, uh, I'm not quite sure where to begin. Um, I guess I'd like to make a couple of points I, on your comments and questions. I'd start there relative to the 3,500 cords that was questioned. That's an existing law. That's not part of the new changes here. Um, that's about 10 to 12 tractor trailer loads, um, about two and a half tons per cord, depending on species, because uh, they vary by weight. It, they the weights vary by species. Um, I believe your your concerns about the noisy chipping is not germane here. Where this wouldn't apply. Those are part of forestry operations. That's that's these are this is about Act 250 permits. Those would be exempt from Act 250. So. It's just not relevant here. Um, re to your comments about needing to hear from a forester, I encourage you to do that. I am myself a licensed forester. I am indeed a state forester of Vermont. Um, and, um, but if you're not satisfied with me because you believe I have some odd philosophy, which is what I heard, um, I encourage you to hear from the foresters. They've all supported it. Uh, there's many of them. Um, and uh, as to balanced testimony, I would encourage you to have some testimony. Um, I think I'd just draw you back to it. You, you have, as the General Assembly, in Title 10, 2601, I believe it is, have established as the policy of the state to encourage the economic management, uh, the conservation and economic management of our woodlands. That is an established policy. And you have done many things over the years uh, in support of that and in furtherance of that. And this falls in as a, as a, a, a modernization, frankly, under climate, under COVID, uh, and is part of the reimagining of Act 250 at 50 uh, with significant support from across. It's not just a proposal of the uh, administration. This is a proposal that's been well vetted with significant testimony and support broadly across the board. I believe you'll hear from VNRC uh, as well uh, uh, on their support for this. So I hope that just recasts and reframes quickly for you what this is and what it isn't. Um, and I'm happy to speak further about the, the, how this connects to things like a changing climate. Uh, and I'd hope to have your, uh, an open mind to consider the very real connection that this all comes from and ties back to for protecting forest integrity and is a significant strategy to thwart forest fragmentation. Okay. Um, and I don't know if... Uh, 
That's like to be helpful, helpful if I, I could. And, Mr. Lincoln. And further technical questions can cover them, but uh, frankly, I'm not really sure where to go listening to how you've begun um, with your considerations here. Well, I, I, don't, and I think, you know, the, the reason I started the biomass energy development working group was to relocalize wood production and help forests help pay their own way, right? Let it, let people make enough money owning forests to keep them forced. So I'm certainly uh, not, uh, at those questions, uh, I'm sensing that they're interpreted as somehow adverse to the bill. I'm just trying to understand how the parts fit together. So, I'd love uh, to try to help you with that, Senator. The um, uh, this this would speak to the root causes of forest fragmentation, which was part of the original fragmentation report in 2015. And as I said yesterday, this is really the last piece that we haven't addressed. I'm excited to have it in. The, the support in the House was wonderful from the uh, conservation groups. It's been fantastic, and uh, so I'm hoping you're you're willing to see that larger picture of this to get back, like you said, with you know I was there that back in the BioE days, Senator, and uh, and I appreciate your sensitivity to that. And this is exactly that. It's an attempt to try to true this up and modernize for uh, to deal with things that weren't uh, considered when Act 250 was was instituted. Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Lee, Deputy Commissioner Lincoln. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I Appreciate the opportunity to present uh, in front of the committee. Uh, for the record, Sam Lincoln, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation. Uh, I'd like to go back quickly to yesterday's testimony about all the data around fragmentation um, and land use and planning for forests and uh, the testimony you heard uh, and uh, a lot of very good information about fragmentation and the, the what the where and the how fragmentation is occurring. But I'll tell you, I was on the edge of my seat when nobody asked why. Nobody asked why these landowners have decided to fragment. Senator McDonald did allude, uh, talked about the current use report um, on intergenerational transfer. But what we're not seeing, or what, what's what's concerning us, what's behind some of this, uh, the, the, uh, the many years of testimony here, the pr uh, presentations in front of the commission on Act 250 at 50, were about issues about investing uh, in adding value to the commodities grown on our forest land in Vermont. And Act 250 is one strategy in land use planning to uh, intervene and stop fragmentation trends. But, and, and, I, and, I, and as a six year development review board member, three year planning commission member in my town, I'm all about proper land use, good planning and strategy. But those, those provisions intervene at the town clerk permit office or the Act 250 permit office. Our strategies are about intervening at a family's kitchen table when they're deciding whether or not they're going to fragment, whether or not they will keep their land as forest land, and, and maybe even consider aggregating forest land to grow uh, healthy habitat, grow healthy, for, valuable forest products. There has been an enormous amount of testimony put in the Act 250 at 50 Commission about the real and very costly and logistically challenging issues with Act 250 permitting that go to these uh, proposals we put forward. Um, small family businesses spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to get Act 250 permits, getting permits that make it so they can't work and get forest products in at night. For make, farmers make hay when the sun shines and, and for the forest economy often it means working at night when it's frozen. And we know that there are fewer and fewer days when the ground is frozen. There are fewer drier days in the summer and we have to be able to work outside normal business hours to pay back the millions of dollars in investment that many people have in these businesses. We were asked not to ask for a wholesale exemption. So we came forward with surgical changes that would be the most impactful to create the most confidence in investment and reinvestment. And uh, they're, they are detailed, they are technical, um, but they are real challenges that are stopping people from investing in businesses if they don't have certainty that they can um, succeed financially in helping enable forest management and returns to landowners, habitat enhancement and things like that. So um, I'm happy to, you know, just, just again, getting to the why, the why are people choosing to fragment their land. And right now, uh, the Senator uh, from Orange uh, spoke earlier, the commissioner did, um, we're in the midst of this pandemic and we have seen- The ash pandemic that's killing trees? 
pandemic? Is that the one you're talking about? The COVID pandemic? Uh, oh, where the, that the one. Okay. pandemic has changed the entire globe's use of forest products. We have huge demand for tissue paper, ener wood energy, various things, but we have a major shift in paper used in offices. That ties all the way back through the supply chain to forest management and forest integrity. And we want to do things that create more a durable economy in Vermont with more smaller scale investment here. We rely heavily on exporting our forest commodities out of state to fewer and fewer larger corporation owned um, uh, processors of forest products that uh, are owned around the globe. We would like to have more of them in the state. Okay. And this uh, Senator Campion has a question. Thanks. I, th I think this might be, I'm not sure if this is going to go to Deputy Commissioner uh, Lincoln or to Ledge Council. So I've got a little chart that I made here. So farms we exempt, and this is a little bit I, back to the commissioner's comment, Commissioner Walker. Farms we exempt, but the processing, the groups that process things for farms, we don't. And then I would say logging, yes, we exempt, but this is looking to exempt the processing related to the logs. Would you say that's, or the, sort of the processing of that? Um, I guess I'm looking to- Not an exemption. A little bit. It's just not an, it's, it's not an exemption. It's, go ahead, Sam. Senator, uh, yeah. so, so this is not an exemption. This is, uh, this is, changes and they all have backstops in, in terms of the undue adverse effect. And I, and I might let- uh, 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 Let me let me correct myself then. Uh, what's another term? Um, I don't like this necessarily, but uh, it, it being treated a different way. The comparison was made earlier to exempting farms. And we know that the, the processing that's involved with things that come off the farm is not exempt um, or given any kind of special treatment. I don't really like that, but uh, logging, Things are exempt, but I just want to go now to there. There is a, a bit of a change, a bit of a shift, a bit of a, a different way of treating the how we would process things after they are logged. That's it, what it, Mr. Chair. If I could, that was my comment. So could I could I respond to it? Could I address and clarify? Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you. So I was make uh, Senator Campion. My, my statement about the. Was, was to clarify based on a comment that the chair made about his concerns about the noisiest forestry operations being a chipper, which uh, typically would be part of a forestry operation that's part of logging and as you know is exempt. This provision doesn't speak to them. It, this is speaking to those enterprises that, that trigger Act 250 and this is not an exemption from that. It's a clarification with backstops appropriately uh, for how those permit conditions would be applied. So that's what I meant, that, an apology if it didn't come across right, but I was responding to the chair's concern that, boy, this seems a bit much when you consider those noisy operations. Um, they wouldn't even, it, we, we can talk about that, but that they're not part of this. This is about the enterprises that add value and uh, that would require an Act 250 permit. And those don't, that's the distinction I was trying to make. Yeah, and I'm sorry, my question, perhaps I wasn't clear. So farms, are exempt. The processing of things that come off of the farms, you know, I'm trying to make the comparison to the processing. That's all. So and I'm it's wondering, analogous here. Completely analogous here. Okay. Can you wait until I finish, please? So then what I'm saying is, so with the logging process that takes place, we know that that's exempt. So afterward, is there a different treatment is there a different sort of special treatment that we would be giving in a way to those that would process uh that logging if i may that, farm, that farms do not receive senator what what the comparison is here is that farms that harvest crops from the fields it's a land-based situation and mm -hmm. and in all land-based uh, uh occupations we're learning more about water quality better practices all these things when a farmer harvests crops, they can take it from the field to the storage facility without, without any restrictions on the hours that they can do that. When a logging operation harvests commodities off the land, they need to be able to take that same crop to the storage facility, the market, the, the enterprise that adds the value and the same ground conditions often apply. We want them to do that when it's frozen or dry enough. And this is a, a, a big part of this, this proposal is that the people, the businesses that receive that material 
that they are that, that conditions can be put on the hours of operation. It's a matter that the allowing when the when the the, the very well known situations in the forest economy when there are shoulder seasons where wood has to be trucked at night or dry conditions during summer logging seasons. Um, that, that might be nights and weekends. It might be the only opportunity the contractor has to get the wood out of the woods without damaging roads and forest soils. Um, and it has been a problem for businesses uh, to not be able to get the wood when the raw materials when they need it. So it would be as though as if there was a gate in front of the farmyard between the field and the farmyard uh, is, is the best, you know, to, to help uh, illustrate the situation. And for the wood energy provisions in there about the deliveries going out. What was that part, Sam? The last piece? The wood energy. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, the, the Ledge Council made the uh, presentation about the wood energy and the delivery out, outbound trucks for that. Um, more and more in the state, we rely on wood energy. The buildings and institutions, the Capitol Complex, National Life, where our offices are, the school that uh, Senator, the chair mentioned, that buy wood almost all of those require nighttime deliveries of the wood. They utilize the same impervious surface for parking cars during the day that they do for maneuvering delivery trucks at night to deliver the wood. So they even the state requires by contract that the wood chips be delivered at night. So they have to be produced and delivered in sequence. And um, that there are times where the trucks have to leave the yards at night from these enterprises. And again, it's a matter of if someone's going to invest millions of dollars in a business to produce the fuel to heat the buildings. If they're going to deliver firewood to a family that's out of wood at night or wood pellets, they have to be able to have the opportunity to have the trucks leave their yard with the pre-processed materials and deliver that. And it, again, it came up in the uh, testimony, I believe that the Act 250 at 50 Commission heard um, that that has been an issue. So these are small windows of time uh, uh, Representative Dean had asked us, he said, don't come back to us. He says, I hear the issues, but don't come back to us asking for an exemption. So we tried to make surgical uh, uh, changes in here that were seasonal, they were limited, they, they're, they're also backstopped by undue adverse effect that was part of the discussions that we had in leading up to this. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Senator McDonald. The, this, the Senate recently approved the burning of wood chips at Brigade with a huge subsidy to this industry for many of the reasons that um, the witnesses have brought forth. That was to spend taxpayer money to make it possible to ship wood to a place that burns it extremely inefficiently. The legislature has taken a huge step in recognizing the requests of the forest industry. Farms take crops to the barn. That's where they go. Milk leaves the barn and goes down country, most of it in trucks that for years have been granted the right to be overweight. That we, that's the break that they've been getting and it is similar, but it is not the forest industry, it's the milk truckers. And that's what we're talking about getting chips to market and when they show up in the market they make they require an act 250 permit to unload we're not saying that the chippers that operate once every 10 years for a couple of weeks in the forests or the noise we're talking about the act 250 for trucking to the facilities that receive it that's what we're talking about and they are different from uh, from milk in that regard so this, this legislature and this Senate has already approved unanimously a huge subsidy to the industry because we thought it made sense. Now this is a new ask and we're trying to consider it carefully. Thank you. So I, I would like to just better understand um, the nature of, I guess, well, in new definition, forest-based enterprise. Uh, you know, maybe I'm sort of old school here. I'm thinking of a log yard and trucks getting loaded and off goes a relatively unprocessed material for further processing elsewhere, whether it's gonna get sawn or whatever. Um, but the, the force space enterprises includes things like sawmills, veneer mills, pulp mills, and 
pellet mills. So are, are we talking about, and those sound like relatively long-term investments that would stay put, not like a chipping operation moving around log yard to log yard. Can you say a little bit about the goal here? Are we talking about allowing basically semi-permanent construction of sawmills, veneer mills, pulp mills, pellet mills uh, in these locations? Yeah, yes, I don't know, Commissioner, do you want to take it? Cool, Sam, sure, you got it. Um, the, yes, this is for permanent structures. We're, we're mm -hmm. the state is currently exporting tens of thousands of tractor trailer loads a year of, of raw materials from our forest to have value added to all these types of mills and they are existing as permanent structures here in the state. This, this would not be for temporary um, uh, mobile facility. You know, there are mobile logging and chipping operations. This yeah. would be for permanent infrastructure, built infrastructure. Okay. So, and that, that's helpful clarification because I think part of what we've traditionally talked about in committee when we're on this topic is uh, what's going on in a log yard or a chipping operation in a log yard? How long is it there? How long are people going in? Because they may well be near residences, whereas this is more like, uh, I don't know, commercial industrial development. Uh, and, and this is only about, um, only about, basically only about hours of operation. You heard some about uh, uh, the, the prime expo, and I'll get to that. But this is about hours of operation. All other Act 250 review conditions, um, environmental standards are, are untouched, are unchanged in all of this. Um, so so to, to, I, I hope that's helpful too as well, that this is, this is only about, again, a, a, what we consider to be a surgical slice of, of change of policy that's really needed by the industry. And it's not in the bill, but I suppose it's kind of in the background. How would land have to be zoned in order to host such a facility? I mean, if you're ag residential, which is what a lot of towns around here are, where I live, um, can uh, a forest-based enterprise be constructed in such a, a zone? Or you have to be in a commercial zone? All the same, there's no change in this to land use planning. If local municipal zoning has uh, prohibitions that applies. Otherwise, it's all the same trigger, jurisdictional triggers and criteria apply. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'm getting a clearer picture of what it's a, a little different picture than what we've been talking about historically in this committee, Understood. which has been more right. at the edge of the forest. How much can you do? How long, et cetera. No. And this is right. these are new facilities to bring this industry back uh, in Vermont. Is that it? Basic value added opportunities. That's the idea. Got it. Thank this, you. This is doesn't, when we say it's hours of operation, um, the Rygate plant runs 24 hours a day. So this isn't about operation of a plant. This is about building facilities that truck products and unload those products and make noise. And that's what Act 250 regulates. Um, that's what we're talking about. Plus, apparently we're also talking about if you're going to build a new one of these things, um, we should relax the laws so that you can build these places um, on prime agricultural land, um, which we, in a way that we wouldn't allow um, other places to be built. So that's also in this bill, is it not? Yeah. May I speak to that, Mr. Chair? Um, is, is that what we're discussing? That's all. That is a provision. It's new language okay. in, in so the bill. That's yeah. another thing we're discussing. We're not discussing the merits of this right now. That's right. we're discussing what it is that we're discussing. <laughs> that's right. So there's new language in the in the slide deck that um, Ms. Schakowsky went through and includes a new section 6093 mitigation of prime max oils. Mr. Lincoln, and, you and finally, that. Mr. Chair. Are we discussing or not discussing discussing the issue of the roadways that go to forests or go up into areas threatened with fragmentation? Is we also discussing that one? Uh, we we haven't really talked about the road rule stuff today per se, but I don't know if uh, the commissioner sees a connection between those two. So, uh, 
Uh, you have you have it right, Mr. Chair. This we're as of now we're speaking of these provisions in 926 uh, that that are un, you know that sure I could make a connection to almost anything in the forest, but and they, they but, but this is not about the roads out there into the woods or as you say, Senator Bray, um, the the operations that we've all talked about before in the woods or at the woods edge. Okay. This is about. Uh, businesses, enterprises that trigger Act 250, and as Sam has said, it's 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 really only taking a look at certain criteria and the permit conditions that associate doesn't change the need for a permit, uh, et cetera. And all the local zoning still applies. It's very, uh, I think Sam used an appropriate word. It's it's an attempt to be fairly surgical, uh, but be be helpful uh, in a surgical uh, attention to the permit conditions relating to these certain criteria. For a, you know facilities that already trigger and would still trigger uh, re review and and and, a, and need a permit. Okay, and so is the basic historical issue here that we're trying to address in these forest-based enterprise definitions and then uh, different language around how they're regulated is that they are different in nature because of things like materials coming in and going out at sort of quote unquote odd hours compared to a traditional business, and that's for the most part, the thing we're trying to manage, how is it, how can someone be reasonably assured that they're gonna be able to operate a business in a manner that uh, allows them to address the real world they live in? Like you can, logs are gonna be coming out at three in the morning and they're gonna to get to your facility at four in the morning. You know, so Senator Bray, this is not a new industry. I just wanna make sure people who are watching, you know, this is, this has been going on for a long time. We are basically, and I'm not saying that I'm against the policy. I just want to pull apart here, yeah, and, and you know what we are doing, whether or not we are treating one industry differently. I just want to go into this with eyes wide open. I appreciate your bringing up that yes, but this is this is a, an industry that's been around for a, a long time. We know. Yeah. If I could, I mean, it's it's a it's a traditional rural industry, and with concentration in in size and different things, new um, new people building homes in the area, it's triggered Act 250 permitting where it may not have been considered by the framers of Act 250. You know, you considered that a lot of the things that weren't considered back then um, in your commission study, and um, so we're we're again not asking for an exemption of all Act 250 review. We're asking or we're asking for these uh, small changes, uh, and the you know to the prime ag soil. We're, we're most of these enterprises are located in rural rural areas. They're an offshoot of another rural enterprise, particularly possibly. Um, and we're asking for the same treatment in prime ag soil that we are for industrial park development in terms of uh, the, the mitigation sequence and things like that. And the reason for that is again, because the these enterprises um, have an enormous conservation effect uh, on the on the, on the on forest integrity and keeping forest as forest. We presented a formula uh, to the Act 250 at 50 commission on even a small facility producing uh, even one of Vermont's smaller mills puts hundreds of thousands, if not tens of millions of dollars into the mailboxes of forest landowners in the state every year. Far, almost, other than current use, the largest conservation program we have is our forest products industry in keeping the, the forest economy supply chain, putting revenue in, in land ownership, holding costs, tax payments, uh, family living expenses to those forest landowners. And so we're not, this proposal is not about letting the gates down and having sawmills paving over beautiful farmland uh, to build yards. But in terms of these businesses- So that means you're gonna drop that provision? I'm sorry, what's the <laughs> You Does that mean you're gonna drop the provision that gives a special exemption and allows farmland to be paved over to build these facilities? It doesn't. Uh, no, it I was doesn't. I was in the middle of explaining. Sorry. Um, maybe if no, I, again, maybe I'm listening. what our intents are. Um, the uh, the provision is about these businesses need to expand and grow, and if they do on land that they own, that if that land happens to be designated as prime ag soil, they're being essentially uh, penalized in the mitigation sequence for expanding a business that conserves land indirectly or directly, however you want to call it. If you look at a three to one minute, you look at a, a 2,500, 22 and a half million board foot sawmill, 
puts millions and millions of dollars into the mailboxes of landowners each year to hold forest land intact. A three to one, four to one mitigation sequence doesn't do anywhere near that. Tens of thousands of acres impacted annually, positively. So that we're, that I'm, I'm saying to you that this is not some veiled attempt to uh, uh, allow industrial uh, buildings to be just, that people are just waiting for this to build on prime ag land. It is another small change that we would like to make for a small number of, of investor uh, businesses to create investment here uh, that doesn't penalize them for doing something they're already doing in great uh, uh, magnitudes more than the mitigation sequence would do. Mr. Um, Chair, um, yep. I don't see any fines or penalties in this legislation. Um, I respect the tradition of, of this forest harvest industry, and I have watched it change over decades. It has gotten bigger. It has gone from daytime to nighttime for reasons that are understandable. It has severed the connection between the people who harvest the logs and took them to the villages in daylight and unloaded those logs and received checks in their pockets and bought milkshakes for the kids in the truck before they went back to the woodlot. This industry asks for change after change after change. And when you are asked to keep a record of, of what you have in your trucks when they leave places at four o'clock in the morning and where those trucks go to with what's in them, you tell us, no, that it's a traditional, it's about in, the integrity of foresters and that it, it is inappropriate. You stymie, you stand in the way of that change, you stand in the way of modernization, you stand in the way of the changes. And when you ask that there be a record, when we ask that there be a record of someone that gets paid for their product, that they be notified by the recipient, that the landowner be notified, you say no. And when we come to changes in Act 250, you ask, you ask, you ask, and you make comparisons, and you ask for special treatment that other industries don't have, and sometimes we listen. And when you ask for subsidies to use your product inefficiently because you're caught in a bind, you're caught in a bind with the price of oil, to use your product inefficiently, we have said yes. But when we ask, that you join other more modern activities, you say no, and you continue to want to have special exemptions. Um, this is this is not a one-way street, and the there have been give and take in this, but sometimes um, there's there's a limit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator McDonald. Um, so, uh, right. I mean, trip tickets, we don't want to start a whole trip ticket conversation right now, but we, we have been disciplined and we haven't brought it up and we, yeah. and yes. some of us resent when others want to bring up what they want to bring up yeah. and, I think and say that trip tickets is just as surgical as anything that's been brought up. So is the notification of landowners who've sold products is just as surgical is this stuff, and it doesn't adversely affect land. It doesn't adversely affect development. Right. It doesn't adversely cause a lot of noise. It doesn't take up prime agricultural land. And and witnesses say no. But when they so want to do all those said. other things, we're supposed Somebody. to say yes. Thank you. Well, I would say one thing. You know, if we're going to draw comparisons to ag, I mean, one thing I think to Senator McDonald's. Uh, uh, point is when you ship milk, you you know exactly how many gallons you had loaded on that tanker, and you get uh, you get milk checks, you get receipts, you get notific. There's a lot of tracking that goes in, in involved. So uh, I find this point well taken. The we're from, not discussing from, that from the producer's point of view. It provides a reasonable record that helps them know what happened to what was taken. And uh, I'm not sure why we find why that's an objectionable, but I wanna go back to the prime ag piece for a moment. And that is if such an operation were uh, permitted, 
and the mill 10, 15, 20 years hence uh, were to close because the industry has shifted yet again. And it, uh, I think of the plywood mill, for instance, in uh, over in Granville. So is that, uh, is that land forever allowed to operate as a quote unquote sort of an industrial spot or does it, the, the exemption was only for uh, a forest-based enterprise. And if it's not another forest-based enterprise, it needs to go back to normal uses for prime ag soils. Um, it's not an exemption. Um, it's a different mitigation sequence. And um, uh, the, the, the long-term use of that was not, is not in the language um, in, in the bill. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I. I. I clearly understand your question, um, and I. But I don't know how we could ever plan for that. Um, I'm not. I'm not certain. Um, it's. It's. Uh, I'm, I'm not, it's. I guess the clearest thing I can say is I. I understand your question, and it's not addressed in the bill. Okay. Well, and it's just something for us to consider for going this direction. It. It might be that the the conditional the greater flexibility we're talking about might only be for this industry. And then should this industry leave, then that you would have to restore or something. But, um, and so I'd ask council to help us look into this before we come back. Uh, uh, it's already uh, a few minutes after 11. So for anyone who was, I apologize, uh, if we're, if, for those who are here only for trails, I don't believe we're gonna be <laughs> talking about trails today because it is a gnarly issue in and of itself, uh, even though we've already got a running start on it. Um, and we might as well spend the, the last 10 minutes we have or so uh, speaking a little more about this one so that we don't gloss over something that's a pending question. Mr. Chair, just for uh, to understand again a little bit, if I may, the process. We're still talking about the, the Senate, at least. We are still on the same page that uh, trails, horse frag, and downtowns will go together as a bill. That is the agreement. Great, thank you. In the committees of jurisdiction and- yep. I just think that's an important thing to, to uh, reiterate um, as we sort of, again, continue to go through this process. Thank you. I, I mean, you can do that. I think you're gonna poison pill the bill. I mean, I don't know if I'll support it with all three sections in it, to be sure. honest with you. Well, there, there's, you know, I would, uh, everyone makes their own choices. So I respect, you know, you need to do what you think is best. Uh, I th think th there's certainly, but I'll, I'll poison pills are slightly <laughs> toxic term, right? So there's definitely no interest in having a poison pill in the bill. It's just that there is give and take. And so people, there's discomfort all the way around, but in the, you know how we end up crafting these things, we end up trying to balance things off. So there's give and take, uh, but I, I think my sense is that all the parties I've talked with all along the way, no one's interested in a poison pill anywhere. They're just interested in saying, how do we come up with something that everyone uh, can agree to in the end because there's enough in it from their, for their point of view, so. The other thing, if, if we're going to be adding anything else, I want to take a look at some point, uh, not now, of course, but at this warden's bill that has been uh, on our, this all, that also might be uh, relevant. Uh, I have big concerns. Um, I I can't hear him. Yeah, Senator Campion, I don't know if it was just me. Your voice disappeared for like the last two sentences. Sorry, I just want to I want to talk at some point uh, about the, the bill on our wall having to do with wardens. Uh, right. And that doesn't have to happen now, but I uh, have concerns. Uh, and but if we can, uh, as we're talking about things that might move in packages, uh, that might be something that we might just keep out there uh, as a conversation. Um, as we move forward to see if maybe if we can get somewhere with that also, it might end up becoming part of this. Sure. Or not, uh, I don't know. Okay, right. H673, which was referred to us maybe a week ago or something like right. that. Um, can we spend just two minutes on that just so that people know what the bill is and why we got it? Um, 
Commissioner Snyder, did you play a role in moving 673 or working with the House to have that moved? So as yes, a, sir. Okay, so with, with sort of a, a vuncular interest in this bill, can you just tell us sort of what happened and why it came forward? Sure, this is a, a bill to modernize the, so the tree warden statutes which date back to 1904, I believe, and really haven't seen a whole lot of change, although a lot of things have changed since. Uh, so the intent of the bill is to organize and importantly clarify um, the roles, responsibilities, rights, and, response, and, um, and rights of uh, private landowners, municipalities with a uh, highway right of way, uh, and clarifying the long-standing uh, statutes of the, the, that require a town to have a tree warden, but they're conflicting with other statutes. They're lacking in definition and clarity, and that's caused some significant problems that you have a case in Addison County, famously, where a landowner is looking at a million dollar plus fine based on the existing statutes. And it seems many people have brought that to us as kind of crazy, and it's towns dif differ in how they approach it. So this is an attempt to, to modernize and clarify and uh, uh, limit confusion and, and conflict. Uh, and um, we proposed a fairly significant modernization at the beginning that I think bordered on advocacy for green spaces in local communities. And uh, there was some pushback from certain quarters, a lot of support in others, um, but we worked well with the house committee of jurisdiction and um, very proud actually. It was very a uh, long process of listening and, and back and forth. And we settled on what passed that has the support of tree wardens, municipalities of Vermont League of Cities and Towns, which have opposed at first, uh, ended up supporting. So we're really proud of it. Hope you will take a good look at it. Uh, and that's the intent of the tree warden bill. Then that uh, that sounds actually quite good. That might be something then that we, I might have been confused with another bill. That looks like something maybe we would attach possibly to this. I'll look to you, Mr. Chair. Um, could well, be a part of the package, something just to keep in mind. Right. We have um, our challenge right now, as everyone knows, is our bandwidth is so limited and uh, yeah. we don't have that much time. However, the um, what is normal for the end of session is sometimes uh, we put more things we we bring things together and get them on the same bus traveling together yeah. so uh, senator cummings was well a christmas tree but uh, uh our our bill of three could become a bill of four right i'd offer a comment on the tree warden bill that i'd offer as uh, hopeful is that uh, you know i know you like to do your good work on it but uh that one had a sort of a uh, disproportionate amount of work uh, with a lot of different parties. So it took a long time. So, you know, maybe you could see it as and trust that that one has been vetted significantly, um, but you know, do your thing. And uh, if we could, we'd love to be helpful. We've got people who can speak okay. to it and help you understand that. Well, we trust that everything we get has already been well vetted and then we, <laughs> we do our due diligence. I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. And, and uh, Senator, so we Senator never Bray, if I could just, I, yeah. You might make just make a comment. I just like to alert you to remind you, you on the subject of trip tickets and harvest notification. Your comment that you don't understand an objection, or that it's not surgical, or or that it's surgical. You have a report from us from a couple of years ago that's very detailed. On that doesn't say don't do it. It says how to do it. Um, and uh, so I'd encourage you. I sent it to Senator McDonald when he called with some questions previously. You have it. It's a it's a detailed report on how to implement at your request to how to implement. Um, trip tickets, harvest notification, what would be involved. And it, it's a thoughtful approach to explain what's involved. It's significant. We didn't say no, we said, here's how, and there's a lot to it. So just, just by way of reminder, and you have that report, uh, and it's, there's a lot of good hard work in there that, that, that I hope you'll take a look at if you're seriously interested in doing that. Okay. Just know that you know, we're, we're trying to be helpful and we're trying to, to be realistic and provide factual information and I'd, I'd hope you'd use it. Uh, it's there for you. Okay, can I ask you a favor? Just because uh, I don't have my hands on that readily. Can you resend it to um, our committee assistant, Judith Newman, and she can post it on our website and distribute it to members of the committee? Mr. Of Chair. Course, happy to. Mr. Chair. Senator McDonald. It was briefly discussed that we would put in the, uh, the, the Rygate bill, a, um, that the administration would break the rules around what the commissioner has just suggested. 
and bring them back to the legislature by a date certain. But we were told that that would clutter up the bill and we should just move the Rygate bill alone. Um, the question of uh, what gets included in this bill, whether it's Act 250 or this or, or other things is a, is a perfect, the, I'm surprised to see that foresters when it comes to this legislation are what I would call in forestry terms, trying to high, high grade this bill where they take the good logs and uh, they leave the rest of the stuff to the detriment of the entire forest. And we know that foresters don't do that anymore. Thank you. All right, well, we're, we're into integrated harvesting in the committee. So we're gonna try oh, to- this, But there's an effort to high grade this, this bill. All right, um, so thanks everyone for the discussion this morning. It's been helpful to better understand the bill and what we are really talking about in terms of force based enterprises. I would encourage everyone on the committee to, um, uh, actually I'll ask Jude to email everyone the PowerPoints so that you may want to print them out and read through um, at any rate to, to study them because we have, uh, we've, received a lot of material in the last three days. And um, the other thing too is just as a side note, S237, the downtown development and designated area development work. Um, a number of interested parties have all weighed in since Wednesday. Um, and so I've been asking Jude to post their comments as well as either she's been sending or I've been sending comments along. So for instance, VLCT has weighed in some, uh, planners and developers have weighed in. Uh, and I think we're gonna be hearing from the Vermont Planners Association next week. Uh, they are working to get a consensus opinion amongst I think something like 150 planners. So it's taking them a little time to get there. Uh, so we're gonna have uh, three burners going on the stove right to the finish line, I think. Um, and I appreciate that everyone is staying good humored and cordial. And I know there's a little, it's a little challenging because things are getting a little tense and we are short of time. So I appreciate uh, everyone's good work. And unless there anyone has anything they want to share, um, we should adjourn because uh, gentlemen will need to put on ties and jackets. We're going to be on the floor in seven minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, See some of you on the floor and to everyone have a good weekend.